A young Jan stands in their respite block. It just so happens that today, whatever date this video is published, is the day they will create their retrospective about Homestuck. Though it was nearly a decade ago that they first encountered the work, it is only today that they will share their opinions on it in the form of a lengthy video essay. Enter name. Your name is Misely Vodgill. You have a variety of interests. You have a passion for linguistics, mathematics, and rhythm games for babies. You like to discuss these interests in videos that you post to troll YouTube, where the lack of consistency tends to alienate your established audience, who are unsure what to expect from any given video. Your troll tag is January misalignment, and you speak in a matter affected by the northern city's vowel shift, a topic which you love explaining to anyone who'll listen. As was previously mentioned, the video you've been working on most recently is about Homestuck, an internet story which is famously difficult to discuss in any remotely understandable way. You have a lot of complex and nuanced thoughts about Homestuck, thoughts which have occupied space in your brain ever since you first read Homestuck as a nerdy teenager. Since you first announced this video as a Patreon incentive, you've been sitting on the idea of it for a long time. You've been sidetracked by various distractions, the most significant of which being the Caramel Donson incident. Additionally, multiple people with bigger platforms than you on Troll YouTube have created their own videos about the topic, which means that if you want your video to be engaging, you'll need to find your own angle to take it in. The script is empty. Light skims the void keeping letters apart, as if phrasing a hollow reference to a certain work, or, say, a confusing framing device. A familiar note is produced. It's the one desperation plays to ask its audience to like, comment, and subscribe. In the human heart, one generation of passions follows another. From the ashes of one springs the spark of the next. Dr. Tom Murphy VII, PhD. You have a feeling it's going to be a long video. Measily. Attempt to describe Homestuck. You attempt to describe Homestuck. You manage to write three words before stopping. You stumble as you search for the correct way to describe its medium. Most others refer to it as a webcomic, but this description has never felt accurate to you. It is technically true that Homestuck is a story told on the internet through a series of images accompanied by text, but you don't think that this makes it a webcomic. Homestuck is a story told in a way that's built out of layers of facade, layers of one medium presented as though it were another. You worry that spending this long talking about Homestuck at this meta level will be confusing at best and boring at worst. How long will you keep this up? How much runtime can you fill with preamble before you actually start talking about your Homestuck opinions? Measily. Stop stalling and talk about Homestuck already. Homestuck is a work of quasi-improvisational web-hosted multimedia fiction. Nope, that's not right. Homestuck is a webcomic. It's a story told through the internet using illustrations and text. But it's also definitely not a webcomic, or at least not just a webcomic. Yes, it's told through illustrations and text, but it also has animations, music, and little interactive games. Homestuck is a work that you play and watch just as much as you read. Homestuck is a webcomic pretending to be a video game. Or actually, it's a video game pretending to be a webcomic. It's a video game pretending to be a webcomic pretending to be a video game? Except, like, that's also a simplification. Homestuck is a browser-based visual novel. The narration is all written in second-person simple present, and you read through the story by clicking links with commands for what the characters in the story should do next, phrased as though they were things that you, the reader, are typing yourself. It's not really trying to imitate the style of a visual novel, it's imitating a completely different type of interactive fiction, often referred to with the unhelpful name interactive webcomic. This badly named medium is a sort of game played between an artist and their audience. The artist draws panels of a webcomic-ish story, and the audience writes suggestions for what should happen next. The most well-known examples of this format are the works Andrew Hussey created on MS Paint Adventures before making Homestuck. When Homestuck first started back in 2009, this is exactly what it was. Hussey put out new pages at an alarming rate, and readers would send in suggestions for what the next page should be. However, as readership increased, the actual suggestions became more of a formality. It was more or less inevitable that someone would suggest the exact thing Hussey already wanted to happen. So, after about a year or so, Hussey started making up all the suggestions themselves. This game Hussey played with themselves, which they used to play with their actual audience, is itself pretending to be another type of game, one with a similarly unhelpful name, an adventure game. Adventure game is a broad genre which includes the subgenres text adventure and point and click adventure. This, naturally, adds another layer of facade to what Homestuck's medium is. The game Hussey pretended to play was one where an artist pretends to be an old school adventure game. Adventure games, especially text based ones, themselves are games which are easiest to understand as a game about pretending to be playing a different type of game. The player enters commands in some approximation of natural language, and the computer responds as though it were a person that the player is speaking to. The computer pretends to be a dungeon master, who can react realistically to any silly idea the player might have for what to do in a given situation. Adventure games are games where you pretend to be playing a tabletop role playing game. Tabletop role playing games, of course, are games about role playing. 
These are games where you and some friends get together and pretend to be characters in a fantasy world. Fantasy, naturally, being a genre defined as a type of fiction which pretends to be folklore, which is a genre of fiction which pretends to be history. So that's what Homestuck is. Homestuck is a visual novel that pretends to be a non-interactive archive of a game where people pretend to be playing a video game about pretending to be playing a tabletop game about pretending to be real people in a setting that pretends to be a type of story that pretends to be reality. Or I guess you could call it a Homestuck-like. After spending the past few minutes describing Homestuck without mentioning a single aspect of its plot, or even its most general premise, the scale of the task to which you have for some reason decided to commit begins to dawn on you. You understand that there is simply no way for this video to be comprehensive, and that you will need to focus on a few specific elements of the work that you have interesting thoughts about. Hours in the Future The Sylph of Blood resumes their very important quest in the land of jelly beans and numbers. The thing about Homestuck is that it focuses a lot on the mechanics of its universe, and I'm not actually talking about world building here. While world building is a major part of Homestuck, this is something even more fundamental than that. Since Homestuck is a visual novel that pretends to be a webcomic that pretends to be an adventure game, its universe operates under video game logic. This isn't merely an artifact of its strange presentation, this is simply a fact of the story. Like, when a character picks something up, they put it in their inventory, in a very video gamey sort of way. And this isn't an abstraction. Both the inventory and the individual item slots in it are understood to be physical objects. These these inventory slots are referred to as capture log cards, and the inventory itself is a Silodex. When you capture log an object to your Silodex, it's stored on one of these cards. The object can then be retrieved later in a method that's different for each character, called that character's fetch modus. Don't worry, these silly names are just getting started. While an object is stored on a capture log card, a code is written on the back. This is a unique identification for that specific object, distorted much like a captcha, hence capture log. These codes are used in Homestuck's version of alchemy, which in video game terms is a crafting system. Using alchemy, you can duplicate any object, as long as you know its code, and as long as you have enough grist, which is an abstract building material obtained by killing monsters. Alchemy requires several pieces of specialized equipment. First of these is at least one capture log card. Next is a punch designix. You insert a capture log card into the designix and type in the code for the object you want to duplicate. This punches holes in the card corresponding to the code you typed in, which irreversibly makes it no longer functional as an inventory slot. If the card used for this process contains an object, this will make that object impossible to retrieve. If sacrificing inventory space to create a copy of some object sounds like a bad deal, remember that capture log cards are themselves physical objects, so you can easily use alchemy to give yourself more inventory space, so long as your fetch modus is versatile enough to allow such things. The next piece of equipment you need is the crux treer. This does a couple different things, but the function that's important for alchemy is that it creates cruxite dowels, which are just cylinders made out of a material called cruxite. Next, you take the punch card and the cruxite to another machine called the totem lathe. It reads the punch card and uses it to carve the cruxite dowel into a specific shape corresponding to the code on the card. Finally, now that you have the carved totem, the last machine needed for alchemy is the alchemeter. This scans the unique shape of the totem, and in exchange for some grist, the amount and type being different depending on the object, creates the object represented by the unique ID encoded by the shape of the carved totem. But while duplicating an object whose code you already know is one thing, the real appeal of alchemy is the ability to use it to combine multiple objects together. There are two ways to do this. The first is to insert multiple cards at the same time into the card reader slot on the totem lathe. Due to the way punch cards work, the two cards cover some of each other's punched holes, performing the bitwise AND operator on the two codes. When this totem is scanned by the alchemist, it creates a new object with the properties of both starting objects. The other way is to use the punch designix to punch multiple codes into the same capture log card. This performs the bitwise OR operator on the codes, which will create an object with the properties of both starting objects, but like, in a different way. Specifically, AND combining makes a new object that has the properties that the two starting objects have in common, any property that object A AND object B have and OR combining makes a new object that has the properties of both objects, the properties that object A OR object B have. Alchemy is one of my favorite things in Homestuck. In a real video game, this mechanic would be completely impossible to implement, and yet within the bounds of the actual story, it feels completely reasonable. And it's genuinely really fun whenever the story takes a break to show characters playing around with alchemy for a few pages. It's cool seeing all the ways characters think to experiment with these mechanics and combine weird things together to get new weapons and outfits and cameras that automatically generate webcomic strips. It's also absurdly complicated. Like, okay, the totem lathe. What's the point of the totem lathe? Why does the creation of these objects involve two separate physical representations of their abstract codes, with both the cards and the totems? Why doesn't the alchemeter just read the cards directly? And this complexity is, like, the point. It's not practical. Later in the story, these unnecessary medial steps end up getting completely skipped, both in fiction and out of fiction. It's written as though you're not supposed to care about these specific details, and yet so much time is spent going over all of these details. Again, Homestuck's alchemy system is great. I happen to really like this stuff. The reason I'm starting with this is that this is, in my opinion, a perfect example of what Homestuck is like as a whole. It introduces so many of these ideas and spends so much time exploring them to the point where it kind of gets in the way of the actual story. 
Measily. Stop alchemizing and get back to the actual story. Yeah, that's probably enough. You don't think you'll ever use most of this stuff anyway. You suddenly remember that there are monsters all around you. It's a good thing death doesn't matter in this universe, because otherwise, you would be in serious trouble. Measily. Strife. Okay, maybe it's a little unfair to say that death doesn't matter in Homestuck, but it kinda doesn't. It's just that there are so many distinct ways for a character to come back to life, I don't think it's even possible to list them all. But let's try it anyway, just for fun. Most player characters have a dream self. While you're asleep, your dream self is awake, and vice versa. There's exceptions to this, because of course there are, but let's ignore those. If your dream self dies, your waking self is still alive. But if your waking self dies, your dream self also dies, but not immediately. And there's a specific mechanic of Homestuck's world where, if someone kisses your waking self's dead body on the mouth while your dream self is still alive, your dream self takes over, merging into your waking body and you come back to life. This is the most straightforward way to revive dead characters. Alternatively, player characters have quest beds, which are physical objects that exist somewhere in the world that they need to find while on their quest. If you have a living dream self and you die while on your quest bed, you once again merge with your dream self, but instead of just coming back to life, this causes you to ascend to God tier, a form that comes with a whole bunch of perks. If you don't have a living dream self, you can still ascend to God tier by dying on a completely different physical object, a revival slab, which does the same thing as a quest bed except it doesn't require a living dream self. One ability that comes with ascending to God tier is conditional immortality. As a God tier, you can't die unless your death would make sense as a satisfying conclusion to your personal story. Specifically, a God tier can only die if their death is heroic or just. If they die in any other way, they come right back to life. Another thing, some characters have life powers, which means, among other things, that they can bring people back from the dead. This is established to only work once per person per life player, but other than that, it doesn't seem to have any limitations. Outside of the dream self and god tier mechanics, some characters are just naturally hard to kill. Vampires can come back to life after seemingly dying, and also there's clowns. Clowns are literally just stated to be hard to kill, specifically because they're clowns. Okay, completely separately, there's a thing in Homestuck called a kernel sprite. Every player character has one of these. If you place some object into your kernel sprite, it transforms into a new entity called a sprite, which functions as a helpful guide that will give you exposition about all the important things that you'll need to do on your quest. This process is called prototyping, and it has a lot of other effects too, but the important one here is that creating a sprite is a way of bringing someone back to life. This has a few strings attached. Most notably, that being turned into a sprite changes your personality significantly, so you're not exactly the same person you were before. Also, sprites are usually prototyped twice, meaning that most of the time, two separate entities are fused together to form a sprite instead of just one person being brought back to life. Also, time travel exists. If someone dies, you can go back in time and stop them from dying. Or, you can use a different type of time travel to jump to an alternate timeline where they never died in the first place. Or, you can retcon the story itself to stop them from dying, which is specifically not time travel, and works completely differently from time travel, or the narrator of the story can just decide to bring a character back to life, which is a completely different thing from retconning. You can also, uh, clone people? I don't know if this should count because cloning someone is pretty much in all aspects making a completely new person, which is very different from bringing someone back to life, except in the case of paradox clones, which are clones that are predestined to become the person that they're a clone of, but that definitely doesn't count as a way of bringing someone back to life. Anyway, there's multiple established ways to clone people, and they might count as ways of reviving someone. And also, ghosts exist, and they're just around hanging out. There's like some restrictions that come with being a ghost, but like not that many. And if you want to stop being a ghost, ghosts can merge with robot bodies to come back to life, or if you get the ring of life, you can give that to a ghost and it'll just fully make them alive again. So that's what, up to 16 distinct ways someone can come back to life in Homestuck? Unless there's some I'm forgetting. The result of this is that it's really hard to take any of the stakes in this story seriously. Characters die all the time, but like, they're fine. They usually come back. Measly. Answer Troll. Your server player has been trying to contact you. You'd better see what they want. Measly, stop it. I can't keep looking up Homestuck pages to use as visuals of this space. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm done with that part now. Did you need to reference something from Homestuck for that one? Does that even count as anything? It's a method for reviving dead characters established in the text of Homestuck, right? So, yeah, I think it counts. I guess. By the way, what's with your typing quirk? I put a lot of thought into mine. You said you wanted me to have a quirk that would let you naturally transition into talking about typing quirks. This works for that, doesn't it? I mean, I guess, yeah. It works perfectly. This is a cool, completely natural conversation that's happening completely organically, and it has my awesome, terrible, unreadable, epic typing quirk. What is this conversation even doing here? Video essays don't need to have plots. Maybe yours don't. But this isn't just a video essay now, is it? This is a video about Homestuck. Boah, title drop.
uh, anyway, go talk about Leet Speak. That's the thing with typing quirks. They're not just a set of rules for what weird variety of Leet Speak a character uses. I mean, they are that, but they're not just that. Typing quirks inform the way characters speak on every single level. Like, in the first draft of this conversation written without the quirk, I said, yeah, it counts. But when I went back and added my typing quirk, I rephrased it to, yeah, I think it counts. Just to show off how the word think is spelled in my quirk. And I'm pronouncing it sick, and you're not going to stop me. Just by having a set of text replacement rules, regardless of what those rules are, characters end up naturally having different speaking styles, because the quirk itself informs their individual lexicons, which then informs their unique ways of saying things. But it's not just a replacement. Like, it's also structures of speaking. The way they use commas and periods and dashes don't have to be fancy lead stuff. It could just be unique and unlike other characters, because it's like that in real life. And it does this cool, like, double parallel. It's both a commentary on the way people talk online, like the type of people who use perfect grammar and use a period at the end of the sentence, and also uses the reader's probable familiarity with the internet to build character. It's like a whole thing. Ho, ho, ho. Exactly. The way Homesick gives each character a distinct voice is honestly so impressive, like, unquestionably. Especially for something with so many characters. There's a risk that every character would end up just kind of talking like Andrew Hussey, but instead only like four characters talk like Andrew Hussey. Lol. It is unfortunate that part of how Homesick actually manages to achieve this is by making everything less accessible. Homesick relies on visuals so much already that it was never really going to be accessible to the blind to begin with, but the fact that the very first character introduced who uses Leetspeak as part of their quirk is herself blind just feels kind of Hmm, you know? Yeah. Also, reading orange text on a light gray background sucks so much and I hate it. Happy to help. At least it's all mostly legible until Act 6. The Act 1. You explained the acts, right? Went over them and everything? No, that was an earlier draft. Damn it. I didn't want to commit to, like, having to summarize every single act and act act and act 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 of Homestuck one at a time. Nobody wants to watch that. Arguable, but fair. The intro to that part was still pretty good though. You might be able to salvage that and just have the rest of the section be something more manageable? Yeah, maybe. Do we need a... Anyway, I'm going to go back and do server player stuff. Haha, <laughs> yes, this has a plot. Or is that too cringe? That's too cringe, I'm not saying that. Try to understand. The problem is that when the subject of Homestuck's narrative structure is broached, our sparing human intellects instantly assume the most ingratiating posture of surrender imaginable but we will do our best to understand regardless. Most human narratives follow what we call the three-act structure, and though we consider it a complicated subject, spanning a wide range of mediums, tropes, and genre conventions, it is ultimately a superficial slice of what Homestucks consider a full narrative experience. Our concept of the three-act structure, in spite of its capacity to fill our art and literature and rule our individual stories like little else, is still just that, a single linear concept, a concept usually denoted by three words, setup, confrontation, resolution. Homestuck is more complicated than that. Homestuck is a story told in seven acts. And yet, to say that Homestuck is seven acts long, while true, can be misleading, because it might lead one to make the very reasonable assumption that after completing the first act of the story, one is approximately one-seventh of the way to the end. This is not even remotely the case. The first act of Homestuck, less than 250 pages long, makes up only 3%, about a thirty-third, of the total page count. The relative lengths of the acts vary so widely that even dividing the story into acts in the first place is mostly a formality. The first three acts introduce the story's main group of four human kids, and the game they play together. The world is being destroyed, and the only way to escape is by playing a Sims-like online video game. After three acts of this, there's an intermission. Homestuck takes a break from the main story for a couple hundred pages to spend some time with a completely different set of characters in their own self-contained story, which will not become relevant to the main plot for quite some time. These characters were introduced earlier, but it's only in this intermission where they get to spend some time in the spotlight. After the intermission is Act 4, an exciting act which answers several questions raised earlier in the story while raising the stakes further for future acts. This is the part of Homestuck where things start to get real. Next is Act 5, where Homestuck takes a break from the main story for a few hundred pages to spend some time with a completely different set of characters, who were introduced earlier but only now get to spend some time in the spotlight. Unlike the last time this happened, the relevance of these characters, an alien race of internet trolls, have to the main story is much more direct. Act 5 shows the trolls playing the same game we've seen the humans play in the first four acts, and it's here where we're told what the purpose of this game even is to begin with. This is followed by the second act of Act 5, which is nearly as long as the first four acts combined. Act 5 Act 2 brings the human and troll stories together, and raises the stakes even further. It all builds up to a single animated sequence that ties up almost every single loose plot thread, with all surviving members of the main cast escaping to a newly created alternate timeline. This is followed by the second intermission, a short animated scene revealing the true form of the self-asserted main antagonist of the story, who is teased as early as the first intermission. Next is Act 6. While Act 5 was divided into two act acts, 
Act 6, which makes up pretty much the entire second half of the story, is divided into six act acts. In this act, Homestuck takes a break from the main story to spend some time with a completely different set of characters, who were hinted at earlier, but only now get properly introduced. The act shows them playing the same game as the humans and trolls we've already met, but unlike the last time this happened, the shorter act acts of Act 6 are broken up with intermissions that jump back to the established cast of characters. Homestuck alternates between these two casts for some time before bringing them together. The lengths of these act acts and act intermissions vary considerably, as you might expect. The fourth act of Act 6 consists of a single animation, while the sixth act of Act 6 is over one-fifth the total page count of Homestuck. But before Act 6, Act 6, Act 6, Act 5 was technically divided into two Act Act Acts, much like how Act 5 was divided into two Act Acts. It's only technically two, though, because after the end of Act 6, Act 5, Act 2, there's Act 6, Act 5, Act 1, again. Then, Act 6, Intermission 5 has a bunch of brief diversions that are, in the story, labeled as intermissions of Act 6, Intermission 5. So you sometimes see Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 6, and the like listed with the other acts and intermissions. Okay, then there's Act 6, Act 6, which, much like Act 6, is divided into six Act Act Acts, with Act Act intermissions between them. At the end of the fifth intermission of Act 6, the main characters finally get together, and also the child version of the Big Bad takes over the narrative of the story. So for the rest of Act 6, the Act Act Acts are that guy's version of the story, and the Act Act intermissions are the actual main plot. Some technically not time travel time shenanigans happen, then Act 6, Act 6, Act 6 has one big fight scene, then it's time for one last act, Act 7, which is a single animation that shows our heroes being awarded for winning the game that this whole story has been about. Then after Act 7, there's the credits, which are the epilogue to Homestuck. So, recap. That's Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Intermission, Act 4, Act 5, Act 1, Act 5, Act 2, Intermission 2, Act 6, Act 1, Act 6, Intermission 1, Act 6, Act 2, Act 6, Intermission 2, Act 6, Act 3, Act 6, Intermission 3, Act 6, Act 4, Act 6, Intermission 4, Act 6, Act 5, Act 1, Act 6, Act 5, Act 2, Act 6, Act 5, Act 1 again, Act 6, Intermission 5, which includes Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 1, Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 2, Intermission doesn't count, Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 3, Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 4, Act 6, Intermission 5, Intermission 5, and and X6 Intermission 5 Intermission 6, then X6 X6 X1, X6 X6 Intermission 1, X6 X6 X2, X6 X6 Intermission 2, X6 X6 X3, X6 X6 Intermission 3, X6 X6 X4, X6 X6 Intermission 4, X6 X6 X5, X6 X6 Intermission 5, X6 X6 X6, X7, and the credits. Measly. Never say act or intermission again. You have successfully spent several minutes communicating the highly controversial opinion that Homestuck's act structure is a little bit silly. How will you ever top this? Say, there sure are some specific numbers that are used a lot in this story. Gee, the art style kinda makes it look like these kids don't have arms sometimes. Look, the selection has too many prices and vows. No, you know what you must do. You must provide actual criticism of the story. Homestuck has real problems that actually matter. You need to talk about those. Measly. Talk about real problems. The Hemospectrum is a really interesting piece of world building. As a feature of Troll Society on Alternia, it's set up in a way where it feels like it's trying to, like, say something about human society. Trolls have different blood colors, and what color blood they have determines how they're treated by society, with a whole hierarchy of blood colors from the high blood trolls at the top to the low blood trolls at the bottom. There's so much that can be done with this concept. Like, okay, let's talk about colors for a second. By labeling this scale as a spectrum, the immediate association is the visible light spectrum, the classic Roy G. Biv thing sorting colors from red to violet. The funny thing about the visible light spectrum is that, uh, it's a spectrum. There aren't exactly seven hues in the range of visible light. These are just labels that are given to specific smaller ranges of wavelengths. Likewise, you could imagine that in troll society, there aren't exactly 11 to 13 discrete blood colors that a troll can have. It's a spectrum, hence the name. That's why the blood colors are called casts. They're not innate qualities that a troll is hatched with, they're a social construct assigned based on whatever label color their blood happens to be closest to. But there's another funny thing about colors. The visible light spectrum is a linear thing that goes from red to violet, but the blood colors in Homestuck include things like purple and fuchsia, colors that are placed on the high end of the spectrum. But those colors aren't part of the actual light spectrum. These colors only exist as a combination of red and blue, and therefore have no place in this linear model of color. Therefore, the model which the hemospectrum is actually using, since it includes these reddish blue and bluish red hues, isn't a line, it's a circle. Unlike a linear color spectrum, a color wheel doesn't have two ends, because it's a circle. There's no reason to declare fuchsia at the top and red at the bottom, since fuchsia and red are right next to each other. You could rotate this wheel around and draw the line separating the top and bottom of the spectrum anywhere you want. It's completely arbitrary. It's almost as though this system isn't something that naturally arises from trolls' biological traits at all, and that it's something completely made up by the ruling class to retroactively justify their position of power in society. And hey, 
Does that remind you of anything? Anyway, after introducing this idea, Homestuck reveals that there are exactly 12 natural blood colors, and they all have innate biological traits unique to each cast. So it's not actually a spectrum. Also, high blood trolls live longer and have fewer offspring than low blood trolls, and it's not because of societal reasons, it's just a natural property that they happen to have. So there actually is a biological justification for the high blood trolls being more powerful in society than the low blood trolls. Like, the hemospectrum could have been used as an allegory for real-world systems of oppression, and then it just wasn't. Which is weird, because it has all the pieces and and indeed all the Pisces that it needs. And it not only doesn't use them, it seemingly goes out of its way to discard them. Carcat, the very first troll Homestuck introduces, has lived his whole life keeping his blood color secret from everyone else. As we eventually learn, his blood is bright red, like human blood, which is a rare mutation which means he doesn't belong in any blood cast. If this is discovered, Carcat would be executed on sight. But luckily for Carcat, Alternia is completely destroyed, and he ends up as the leader of a diverse group of young trolls, all from different blood casts, who get the opportunity to build a completely new society from the ground up. And boy, I sure can't wait to see what this guy, whose main character trait is his tendency to get angry about things, has to say about what particular aspects of Alternian society he could do without. You know, just one scene, somewhere, literally anywhere, where Carcat talks to the other trolls about how maybe society shouldn't be built around assigning different social roles to different blood colors. It's going to be so great when we eventually get to see that happen. But we don't get that. What we get instead is Act 6, Intermission 3. Act 6 Intermission 3 is the part of Homestuck where Andrew Hussey interrupts the story so their author self-insert character can turn to the camera and explain their opinions on 2012-era Tumblr feminism. It is inscrutable. You cannot screw it. Since Act 6 focuses on these alternate timeline child versions of the main kids, guardians, and ancestors, the idea was, I guess, that it might be fun to do the same thing for the trolls. And there was this whole thing in Act 5 that established a group of ancestors for all 12 of the main trolls, but only like two to four of them were fleshed out at all as characters. So maybe having a section of the story that focuses on child versions of those characters from an alternate timeline could accomplish something. Two of these new trolls were introduced earlier in Act 6, and Intermission 3 brings in the other ten. None of them matter to the overall story at any point, but we're still given a decent amount of time to get to know what they're all like. And, uh, it's bad. It sucks to read. It's easily the worst part of Homestuck. The majority of the intermission consists of a series of interactive games where you wander around the afterlife talking to all the new trolls. These walk-around games are a well-established part of Homestuck's format, and most of them are genuine highlights of the work. The first walk-around in the intermission starts with talking to some already established characters for a while. Unlike previous walk-around games in Homestuck, the dialogue in this part is formatted like Tumblr posts, so people often punctuate their statements with hashtags. The first new character you meet is Kenkri, who you overhear talking at Carcat about his opinions on troll society, and specifically the differences between troll society and the respect universes. The joke with Kankri is that he rambles forever about social issues that nobody cares about, and everyone in-universe thinks he's annoying, and you're not supposed to actually read anything he says. He's a pleb comics tier stereotypical social justice warrior. He talks about microaggressions and trigger warnings and checking your privilege because he's a Tumblr SJW from 2012 and that's the joke. Next, you run into Latula. Her main cast counterpart is blind, so as a funny twist, Latula lacks a sense of smell. Which is supposed to be funny because that's not a real disability. This was back before the current circumstances, but it was still only barely a joke at the time. Uh, she's also a cool gamer girl, but like a 90s gamer girl. Anyway, then there's Porim, a teenage girl who looks like this. She talks to Kankri, and we learn that she's, uh, a men's rights activist? Like, okay, not literally, but the way Porum is written, she talks about gender equality in the way MRAs on Tumblr in 2012 talked about it, and Kankri, the unreasonable SJW, dismisses all of her complaints because matriarchy, it is not subtle. But don't worry, in case you didn't get it, in case you thought this might have actually been about something else, later on, Andrew Hussey's author self-insert literally shows up to spell out explicitly what the point is of these characters. Kankri is bad at social justice. You're not supposed to like him. Porum is the reasonable one who's good at social justice. Man, I wonder why there's all these bits where Kankri complains about other characters using ableist slurs, and in a way where it doesn't seem like he even knows what the term means. I wonder why Homestuck, in 2012, thought, isn't it annoying when someone tells you it's bad to use ableist slurs was a fun, relatable joke to make. Hmm. Anyway, after this walk around, there's a short scene with the Prospect Kids, then there's a second walk around game. This one starts with Cronus, a guy you're not supposed to like, who constantly flirts with everyone. He's also human kin, which you might think is a joke that's aged poorly, but I was there in 2012, and this was not funny at the time either. Then there's Matuna, another character you're not supposed to like. The joke with him is that he has brain damage. 
You're introduced to him by watching him fall on his face. His typing quirk is the hardest to read of anyone in the story, as a cool metaphor for how Hussey thinks it's hard to understand the speaking patterns of disabled people. And if you do happen to be fluent in elite speak, your award for parsing these sequences of letters and numbers is being able to understand exactly how much of a bummer this is. Again, it wasn't another time. This was only a decade ago. People at the time were fully aware how much this joke sucks. At the end of one conversation with Matuna, Kankri shows up out of nowhere and says a bunch of explicitly ableist things, which is, I guess, trying to be some sort of commentary on something. Like, the SJWs are the real ableists level commentary. Except nobody challenges Kankri on any of the stuff he says here, and everything else with Matuna is framed like, you're supposed to think it's funny that he's disabled. So basically, what the heck? Why is this here? I hate reading this, and so on. Okay, I don't want to keep going through all of these characters. This was a bad idea. Uh, I will bring up Damara, a teenage girl who speaks entirely in sexually explicit statements Google translated into Japanese. Other characters refer to this as an Eastern before an accent. Do I need to spell out why this is bad writing? Act 6, Intermission 3, or like specifically these three walk-around games that make up the majority of the runtime of Act 6, Intermission 3, is Homestuck at its worst. It represents everything that makes me not want to recommend Homestuck to other people, even though this work is one that I personally have gotten a lot of enjoyment from. Homestuck has some truly great things, but it also has some absolute garbage. But like, it's not as simple as Homestuck is trash. My opinions on Homestuck are definitely more negative than positive, and I don't even really feel comfortable saying that I like it, specifically because of things like Act 6 Intermission 3 that are truly insufferable to read through. But really, Homestuck is just way too massive to ever be just one thing. There is so much of it. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, and it does so many different things that if you spend enough time with it, it becomes next to impossible to stop seeing little bits of Homestuck in other works. Homestuck is like Dark Souls in that people love comparing other things to it. And that's because a lot of things are a little bit like Homestuck, because Homestuck does so many things. But there isn't anything out there that's anywhere close to doing everything Homestuck did. Homestuck is a work of fiction that elevated what stories told through the internet could be. I doubt there will ever be anything like it ever again, which is good because Homestuck sucks. But it's also really good, but it's trash and you shouldn't read it. It. But you know, this isn't a review. I'm not here to tell you if you should spend your hard-earned zero dollars on reading this free internet story. I've been Jan Misely, and if you do decide to read Homestuck, just make sure you don't read it on Homestuck.com. A lot of really important scenes in Homestuck relied on Adobe Flash, which isn't supported anymore by modern web browsers. The best way to read Homestuck in the current year is the unofficial Homestuck Collection, an offline application that emulates the experience of reading Homestuck on a period-accurate internet browser, with a bunch of quality-of-life features that make it honestly a better experience than reading Homestuck online ever was to begin with. I also recommend installing the Slur Replacement Project. You can read for yourself what it does and decide if it's right for you. I'm not your mom.